everybody. You guys are having a good morning, huh? Do you know how I know that? Because it's raining. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I love the rain. All right, a couple of announcements before we get started. But while we're doing announcements, if you need a Bible, we have extra Bibles in the back. So go ahead and raise your hand. Charles can get you a Bible. We have one, two, three. You can follow along with us. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 8 this morning. <clears throat> so go ahead and get your Bible and turn there. A few announcements. First of all, on this next Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, we're having a young adults picnic or college-age picnic Saturday in Sunset Park. If you're a young adult, college-age or whatever, and you want to go to that thing, uh, go ahead and talk to Min. Min's right there. Raise your hand. After the service, she can fill you in on the details, tell you where they're meeting. It's at 9 o'clock, April 16th, this Saturday. Uh, they're going to have some fellowship. We had a little, a little party out in Sunset Park couple Fridays ago and it was just absolutely gorgeous. It's so nice the weather right now and be able to go out to the park and spend some time with your family and friends and stuff. So if, if you guys are, if you guys have the time, I'd make it over there. It's going to be fun. And then on the 22nd is our monthly men's event. Uh, this month, April, we are going golfing. Uh, many of you guys, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Angel Golf Course up in Summerlin. But it's five bucks. It's a nine hole putting green that has water hazards and sand traps. It's a lot of fun. If you're, if you're very competitive, probably shouldn't come to that because I'm going to win. I don't want to hurt your feelings. <clears throat> I'm not kidding. And then a couple of big announcements. This is exciting because last year we had a blast. Our annual, second annual Paradise Calvary Chapel summer camping trip is June 9th through the 8th, or through the 12th, 9th through the 18th, 9th through the 31st. We're going to have a ball. Bring your own shower, please. June 9th through the 12th, and last year we had a, a fantastic time. We get this big group site up in Panguitch Lake in southern Utah. Uh, we have this big group site that has an amphitheater. We have devotions every morning. We, we rent a boat. We go on hikes. It is really an incredible time. You, everybody's welcome and invited. The kids have a blast. It's like just 24-hour play, play time and uh, exploring. And uh, so if, if you're interested in that, today we, we're starting to announce just for interest. If you're interested in that, we have a, a sign up in the back. I really want to encourage you, even if you're just interested to sign up so we can have a gauge on who all is coming. Um, you can talk to the person at the information station as well. They can fill you in on the pricing, what it includes, what it doesn't include, all those kind of things. It's, it's a good deal. It's a good deal, and we're providing uh, the lunches and the dinners. So the only thing that you have to worry about bringing it up on the camping trip is your breakfast stuff, if you want to have cereal or whatever the case may be. And then we do, uh, the, the price includes the lunch and the dinner and in that time that we're together. We're going to have church up there that Sunday in the amphitheater. We're going to have somebody fill in down here, but we're all going to have our church service up there on Sunday morning. And um, it's going to be... It's going to be a good time. So go ahead and check that out. Also, there's a couple, ca a couple columns. If you have extra camping gear that you're probably not going to take and you want to help a brother or sister out who doesn't have it, you can write your name down there and the gear that you have. Or if you have a need, maybe you're thinking, I haven't been camping yet and, and I don't have any of that stuff. Well, guess what? There's a bunch of people that love you and want you to go camping. So... There's going to be a need list and a donate list and the people who have the extra stuff, you just jot your stuff down so we can coordinate who has what and uh, we'll get things going. We want to give you plenty of time so that you can take your time off work and whatnot. But it is going to be, I can tell you, it's going to be a blast. I encourage you to come with us. And then also, we're, uh, we've, only, we've only printed since we started one t-shirt. And um, you can see people running around with it. But we're going to do another printing of some t Paradise Calvary Chapel t-shirts. Th here's three different options that we have to choose from. Those are also going to be on the back table 
after the service, and you can pre-order those starting today. So if you want one of those shirts or, you know, you want to get a few shirts for the family and uh, just write down your name, you can, you can pay. And, and as soon as we get a, a little bit of a list accumulated, we're going to send that order in, and then you'll get them pretty quickly once we set the order in, okay? So... I think that's it. Lastly, we're still technically at the beginning of the month. We have our April, April calendars. Those are also on the back table. If you want to see the different events and stuff we have going on throughout the week, go ahead and check that out. I have no update for you this morning about the building. I told you guys a couple weeks ago and last week that um, we are in the process of getting into our own building. So we've been talking back and forth with with the, the leasers, and uh, we, had, we don't have an update yet, but we're hoping and praying that this week we'll have an update, and I want to encourage you guys to pray for us so that we can see and step out in faith and in obedience to what the Lord's doing this season in Paradise Calvary Chapel. Amen? Amen. So you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you know that there's many people in the world that want to complicate what you've done for us. They want to make it more difficult. They want to make it mysterious. But clearly in your word, you say to us that, that it's so simple that even a little child can understand. Yet we look around us and there's so many people who are deceived or so many people who are just wanting to do their own thing, but you, by your grace and by your mercy, you've clearly shown us what is required. You've clearly defined for us what it means to have relationship with you. And you've made that way open. You've opened the door for us, Lord. And, and for that, we're thankful. And we want to thank you also this morning, Lord, for, for communicating these truths so clearly to us. Here in the book of Hebrews, you have, you have communicated to us your heart, your love, and how the new covenant in your son Jesus Christ is better than anything else. And there's no reason for anybody to put any kind of burden on themselves when your way is easy, your yoke is light. Remind us that truth today, Lord, sow it in our hearts and give us the ability to process it so that we can give it to others, so that we can speak truth into people's lives and, and help them understand that you've made the way simple and easy so that people can know who you are. We want to know from the beginning, but Lord, we want to continue to learn so teach us through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today in Hebrews chapter 8, the title of the message is, What's the Main Point? You guys like main points? I, used to, I, used to, I say it all the time. Somebody's talking and talking and talking and, and, and so much information and I say, Stop. What's the main point? Give me the bottom line. What does it boil down to? You know, you put some chicken stock in a, in a pot. You put the whole chicken in. We didn't even have that kind of stuff when we lived in Croatia. Grace would buy a, a whole chicken or two and we would eat it for dinner one night and then for the next night's dinner, she would boil it down to the goodness. What's, what's it boil down to? Who doesn't like chicken soup? But what's the main point? The writer of Hebrews has been expressing to the Hebrews who were supposed to be the superstars of the faith. He's been writing to them, reminding them these things over and over again, almost to a point of repetition. But it's important because they need to realize and understand what he's saying. So if we look in in chapter 8 and we start out at the beginning of the chapter what does it say he says now this is the main point of the things we've been saying tell it how it is i've talked to christian brothers or sisters who try to make things so complicated 
And it's about this and, and you know, almost, almost going back to when, when the Gnostics who, who would teach that there's a higher level of understanding that you can't really know who God is. God didn't really make it clear and, and easy for you. There's a higher level of understanding that you won't be able to, to tap into or to get unless you join our little group, our little secret society, and you teach our stuff. I just talked to one of these guys recently, me and a brother, ran into a guy from the, the Mother of God cult. I don't know if you guys have heard of these people but they're going around teaching about how there's a God the mother, there's a God the father, so therefore there's a God the mother, which doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Their, their scriptures don't make any sense whatsoever. They believe that Jesus Christ, his second coming, he, he already came. That the founder of their group is Jesus Christ in his second coming, and he set up and established their church, and then he died. And when we got to that point, it blew my mind. I almost yelled at the guy. I'm like, are you telling me my Jesus came back and he, he died mortally? Well, yeah, because he fulfilled the second covenant. He didn't have to live anymore. I'm like, are you joking, man? There's deception. There's deception out there. And the main tool that the enemy wants to use for people, even for us who are rooted in the word, is to make the simple gospel more complicated than it really is. I ask a question, have you shared your faith lately? Somebody may say yes, somebody may say a little, maybe somebody would say no, but listen, as a Christian, it's easy to share your faith. Okay, it's not easy. It's not easy to be put in a difficult situation. It's not easy to be kind of put on the spot. But if we're looking at the bare bones of what the gospel is, this is the meat of it in Hebrews chapter 8. This is the stuff that gets me excited because I like talking about Jesus dying on the cross and I like talking about, you know, redemption and forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But this stuff, it explains the nuts and bolts of salvation. And he says to the Hebrews, who should know by now that this is the main point. If you guys have been tracking with me, Hebrews, if you've been following me at all, listen to this now. This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. What? Seems kind of simple, Tim. We're talking about deep spiritual truths or what here? Yeah. And you know, the first thing, when the enemy comes to deceive somebody, the first thing that he uses is the position of Jesus Christ before God. To take away the deity of Jesus Christ takes away your relationship with God. Okay? Okay? That's a good rule of thumb if you want to identify somebody as a cult or not, as a sect or not, as somebody who's in the truth or not. Ask what they think about the deity of Jesus Christ. The mother of God cult, for example, since we already brought it up. What do they believe about the deity of Jesus Christ? Well, he died. Is, Is that God? Can God die? Does God play games? Does he die and raise from the dead and then die again and not raise from the dead because of their somewhat twisted, very much twisted, theological position on who God the Father is? We're going to look at three things that he covers here with the main point being the position that Jesus has in heaven, the second thing being the the copy of the heavenly things, the temple and the instruments that were used uh, that Moses introduced in the Old Testament was a reflection or a copy of those same things in heaven. And the third things, the third thing, the better covenant. The better covenant. God made two covenants with mankind, the old one and the new one. That's why we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. So he says, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, 
a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. It is surprising to me how often it happens that people not only remove Jesus from his rightful place in heaven, but this is the, this is the, this is the, the main deal, okay? Listen, the, the, the main thing, and we're going to see it developed here in this chapter, if, if that it's, is that if it's not just about Jesus and the work that he's accomplished— if you can do anything, if you can do any work and obtain uh, reconciliation and faith to God, then Jesus died for nothing. He, he died for nothing. It's either one or the other. And over and over again, in, in, especially in the cults and the sects, but, I, but I've seen it even creep into the evangelical church. There's a there's a gauge on spirituality based on what you do. And then that gauge that's based on how spiritual, spiritual you are by what you do starts to make you feel whether, like you're, whether you're worthy or not to come to God or whether you're not. This is dangerous. This is dangerous. Because your high priest is seated in the heavenlies and he's the one that's given you free access to God the Father. If you at any point think that what you do uh, contributes to or helps with your salvation or helps with your relationship to God, then that's from the enemy. That's from the enemy. Now, I'm not talking about doing good works and that being a part of the Christian life experience because it is. That's called fruit. The New Testament says that when we live and follow the Lord and we're, we're filled and walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, we produce fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is not works. Fruit is the result of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. In fact, this is such a big deal that Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 1, and he says, even if an angel, have you guys ever seen an angel before? If you want to, look, there's one sitting right there. Aww. If you, sorry, babe, she's turning red. You didn't know until I told you, though, because you can't see her face. Sorry. If you haven't seen an angel, you're in good company because I haven't seen one either. But from what I understand, they're magnificent. They're beautiful, right? They're radiant. They're glowing. They're, they're amazing. And whenever in the Bible a, an angel appeared to somebody, what would happen? They would fall down. And Paul says to the Galatians, even if an angel of light appears to you and preaches to you a different gospel, may it be anathema, accursed. To the furthest depths of hell is that word, accursed. Why? Because it's a fine line. If there's an angel coming to tell me that I have to do anything to receive relationship or continue in a relationship with God besides his son, Jesus Christ, oh man, oh boy, it's better for that person to have a millstone hung around their neck and thrown into the depths of the sea. Why? Because God's desire and his passion is that it would be easy to come to him. The difference is the old covenant making it difficult to get to God. The new covenant through Jesus Christ making it simple and easy. And the focus being, the focus being to remind us that it needs to stay that simple. A minister of the sanctuary, Jesus Christ in the heavenlies, Verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it's necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if, we, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since these priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern 
shown you on the mountain. Now, this is one of those things that may be a little bit more difficult to understand, but think about this. You're building a building. Or tearing one down. You're building a building, and you have plans to build this building. What do you do? You have blueprints, and, and, and you might even build a scale model so that you can tell what the building's going to look like. In fact, I had a brother who had a scale model on hand, brought it in for you guys just to illustrate if you want to come up and look at it after. Right over here, that's a scale model of a swimming pool area that's, that was, uh, was being built in, at, a, at a Hard Rock Casino, right? And you can see that thing, and you look at it, and you see it. And it looks kind of cool, right? It's just it's a model. It's 3D. But imagine in real life what it looks like. Is it going to look better than that? I mean, that one's, you know, it's, it's a 3D printed. It's, it's a little bit rough, and you maybe can put some little trees or something or whatever to make it nicer. But the model, if, if it's to scale and it's smaller, the model is never going to be as cool as what's being built, right? It's just not comparable. The people who built that or the people who big, build these big buildings, you know, they have the models in their office. Do you think that that's what they, 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 they glory in? Look at this model. It's amazing. This is the best model ever. Well, this is the, the floor that you're on. This is the window that you're looking through right now. It blows your mind. It, it, it transcends what the model can give you. In the Bible, what we just read was that, that God gave Moses certain instructions to build a tabernacle on earth. And that tabernacle on earth was just a model. It was just a model. He says, I'm going to bring my presence down into the tabernacle. I'm going to live amongst you. When you're in the desert, I'm going to be there in a pillar of flame by day, and a pillar of flame by night, and a pillar of smoke by day. And you think, that's pretty cool. I would like to see God as a pillar of flame. I would like to experience going into the temple, looking at the model of what God intended to do, but not really understanding that that was just supposed to be a foreshadowing of how he intended it to be in heaven. And he's saying these priesthoods, they, they have things to offer on a daily basis, but Jesus Christ, the high priest, he's not in the model He's not confined by the old covenant. He's not supposed to be doing the things the priests did while they were on the earth. He's in heaven. He's in the heavenly sanctuary. He's in the place that was copied to give to us on earth so we could start to understand what it was going to be like. And I still don't really understand fully what that means or what it looks like because I haven't seen it. But it does remind us that our, the focus and emphasis isn't on the earthly kingdom. It's not on the earthly kingdom. Even for the Jews at that time, he was saying to them, even for you guys, you Israelites who have received the promises, it's not, the emphasis is not on that. It's on Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, forever making intercession for you, giving you access directly to God the Father who served the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For God said, capital H, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now, verse 6, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he's also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So here we have th three things that, that are spoken of about Jesus. You can jot these down if you want. Jesus is a better priesthood. The priesthood he's part of is a better priesthood than the earthly priesthood. Okay? The second thing is he's, he's part of offering a better covenant, a better promise, or a covenant being the agreement, rather. And then the third thing being better promises, Everything that we have through Jesus Christ to God exceeds and is much better than what they had in the old system in the Old Testament. So when people come in and they start to try to reinstitute laws for Christians to live by, they start saying, these are the things that you have to do to be a good Christian. These are the kind of clothes you have to wear. These are the kind of music. This is the kind of music you have to listen to. These are the kind of things that you have to say. 
And then we're going to judge whether or not you're a genuine believer based on how you do those things. And you go into some churches, they all dress the same. They all talk the same. They've all got the same haircut. In fact, I think I'm going to require from now on everybody gets this same haircut. <laughs> Just for fun. Some of you are okay. Close enough. No. That's not the case. It's not based on the old system of works. The new covenant is just the blood of Jesus alone that gives us that access to God. So he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Is the ministry of Jesus seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father mediating for us better than that of the priest that was on the earth in the Old Testament? Heck yeah. Like a lot better. So therefore, since he's inherited a better ministry, a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he also is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. I was kind of reminiscing this past week. A brother in the church mentioned something about um, riding dirt bikes, quads. I used to go out to Dumont all the time. If you guys are familiar with Dumont, it's out in the middle of the desert, a bunch of sand dunes. I had a dirt bike. I had a, uh, a Banshee four-wheeler 350. Actually, I had it almost up to 400 cc's, my, my, my bike. I'd rip people apart on Competition Hill. You don't even know. You think I'm fast now, just running? Just imagine me on a banshee. I had a sand rail. We were out there all the time. And we had this saying, you know, there was something wrong or it wasn't running right. And there were these guys who had a lot of money and they were just, you know, they had, they had a whole trailer full of extra parts. I kid you not, I was with a friend one time and we were in his dad's dune buggy and we were cruising all around and all of a sudden he's like, hey, let's see if I can do a wheelie. So he stops. It's a four-seater. There's four big guys in it and he tries to pop the wheelie and he hits it and, he, and it goes, mm, kunk, kunk, kunk. I'm like, oh, that didn't sound good. He, he broke the transmission. We, we push it a little ways, get somebody to tow us back to camp. We tell his dad what happened. He, sounds, he said, it sounds like you, you guys th you threw the transmission. But don't worry, I got an extra transmission in the trailer. Pull it over here. Pull it over, took the engine off, put a new transmission in, put a new engine in. But we had this saying, though, you know, for those of us, especially who didn't have extra trailers like me, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't replace something that, that, that is working fine the way that it was supposed to. Even when you're doing upgrades, you know, wait until the thing that you're using, wait till it's broken. And, and God has the same kind of philosophy. If it ain't broke, he don't fix it. The reason that he had to institute a new covenant is because the old one was broken. Not in that it in itself was broken. No, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. It showed the people that they could not live up to the covenant. It showed the people that as hard as they tried and as good as they tried to be and as ethical and as law-abiding as possible, they still fell short over and over and over again. That is what the law is supposed to do. The law is a tutor for us to show us the, perf the perfect Jesus Christ. I think it was last week we talked about the uh, depression rate in Utah. Here we have a religious system set up there in Utah that has its own brand of laws and religious regulations. And the people are experiencing all over again, just like the people in the Old Testament experience, that they can't do it. I don't know, maybe some of you guys can do it, but I've tried before. I've tried to be that good person, always doing the right thing. And you know what? I always failed. I always made mistakes, and I'm like, I'm tired of making mistakes. I'm That's because the old covenant was supposed to show you it was flawed to a certain degree, but now the new covenant 
allows you to, through faith alone in Jesus Christ as a, as a gift of God to receive that perfect access to him through his works, through his perfection. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he said, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. God says, I recognize that you guys can't do it. I recognize that I gave you a law and you've tried, but you cannot. And he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. You know what the wordage of the old covenant is? If you the old covenant law was, if you do these things, if you obey these rules, if you do this, et cetera, et cetera, then I will bless you. Then I can have a relationship with you. If you, if you, if you. Now we get to the new covenant. And what does God say in this verse? He says, I will. I will give you a new covenant that will not require you to, if you do certain things, have access to me. Know me. Be near me. I will do it, not you. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make in the, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You see what I'm saying about the nuts and bolts of the gospel? God has reasons and purposes for doing things. Because you guys cannot do it, here's how I'm going to do it, and here's what I am going to do. But imagine a scenario, right, where I make an agreement with you or a covenant, I say, listen, every, every uh, two years, I'm going to buy you a brand new car of your choosing. If you do this thing for me, you have to, uh, you know, wash my car every week. Time goes by, and there comes a point where, where uh, that's the covenant, and you say, I don't want to wash your car anymore. And I say, well, I'm not going to give you a new car anymore every two years. And they say, fine, it's not fair. And, 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 and you stop washing my car. And I say, this isn't cool, man. My car's dirty all the time. I need somebody to wash it. Call you up and say, hey, I'm going to make a new deal with you. Listen, you don't have to wash my car. All you have to do is come over and hang out with me and talk to me. Just hang out with me. You know how you'd wash the car and I'd go out there and we would have fellowship with each other? I wasn't sitting in my house by myself. I was out there with you, you know, talking to you and having, that's what I miss. I want the fellowship and I want you to just come over my house once a week and hang out with me and talk to me and that's it. And, and, and maybe you would say, well, the, the problem I had wasn't with you. I love you. You're a great person. You buy me a new car every two years. The problem was with all the work I had to do for it, you know? Like I got to come over and clean your, your, your car and it's a flawed example, but just follow me, okay? I like trucks and cars. So, so I say, okay, the new covenant is that if you, if, if you just come in the new agreement, if you come hang out with me, I'll get you a new car every two years. That's a great deal, right? A little bit of time goes by. You're going, you're hanging out, you're getting your new cars, etc., etc. The best of the best, right, when it comes out. And there comes a time where, where you feel guilty. Oh, man, I should start washing his car again. So you go over and start washing his car. And he's like, hey, what, what are you doing, man? I, I don't want you to wash my car anymore. I just want you to hang out with me. I just want to have fellowship with you. Oh, no, no, no. If I, if I want this next car, I better make sure that yours is, is, is nice and clean the way it's supposed to be. I said, no, that's the old agreement. You know, why, would, why do you want to go back to 
what was agreed before. The new agreement's clear. You don't have to work anymore. You don't have to do that anymore. And this is what some Christians do nowadays, or the enemy deceives people into thinking that God is placing re- a, a, a system of requirements or laws on them that they have to abide by to have fellowship with God. And the, the reality is it's not true. It's not true. If his desire so simply is to have fellowship with you and you come boldly to him through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, you will have that access. You doing anything is not going to make that access better or greater. And listen to what what he says. He says, Behold, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant in the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out of the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant, I disregarded them, saying, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, I will put my laws in their mind and I'll write them on their hearts. I love the Old Testament's examples or or speaking of what's going to happen in the New Testament future. Because that's pretty, pretty clear, right? instead of the law being written on tablets and you being forced to keep those things, under the new covenant, I'm going to write those things on your mind. I'm going to put those things in your heart. Do you know why? Because the things that are on my mind, those are the things that I do. The things that are in my heart, those are my desires and my passions. And I don't do those things because I have to. I do those things because I want to. And God says, I'm not going to force you to keep the law anymore, but I'm going to give you a desire to be righteous like me. I'm going to allow you through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is another part of the new covenant, to live a life that is more fruitful and overall better than living in the law could ever have been. Can I get an amen? You guys follow? It's very, it's very distinct. I'm going to allow you to do the desires of your heart. You know why I, I sin now? Newsflash. I still sin. But I sin less than I did before I knew the Lord. You know why? Because I don't want to anymore. I don't want to live like that. I don't want to displease the majesty in heaven, as that one verse said again, who sent his son on my behalf. I don't want to sin. You know what my biggest sin was? Everybody has their own thing, right? And and, and you can can identify it one way or the other. But you know what my biggest sin was? And I'll, I'll confess to you what it still can be sometimes. Do you know what it is? It's me. I was my biggest sin. I didn't want to have to do with anything, any, have anything to do with what anybody else wanted to do. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And when it came down to it, I didn't care what God wanted for me because I was free. I didn't have to live under the yoke and the bondage of my parents anymore. And I wasn't going to put myself under the yoke and the bondage of God because he's a, he's a, a law giver. He's a, he's a father in heaven waiting to smack me around for doing wrong. And I said, I don't want to be accountable to that. You know who I want to be accountable to? Me. I want to just do what I want to do. I want to have fun. Very quickly I realized that by me desiring to do my own will and not what God's will was, not only was I separating myself from him even though he gave me access, I was experiencing death on a more frequent basis. Literally, right? I was experiencing death. I had friends that were dying. Because of my lifestyle, my body was breaking down faster, even as a young man. Drugs and alcohol will do that to you. You can look at the pictures on the interwebs and see before and after of what drugs do to you. The choices I was making, they were being manifested and and shown to me as death. Or something like when you're 19, 18 years old and one of your best friend dies because he was out being stupid. 
I had a friend that was uh, uh, living in Vegas right at that, uh, right after I started walking with the Lord and I moved overseas to go to Bible college. I got a phone call, an urgent phone call. And back then in the early 2000s, it was much more difficult to communicate. And I got an urgent phone call through a pay phone that one of my good friends from high school had died in a fiery car accident because, you know, he thought it was okay to, to drink da Jack Daniels and drive his truck around the streets of Las Vegas at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is the kind of stupid stuff that we did before. It brings death. It produces death. But the new covenant, he says, I will put my covenant, I'll put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. You know, all throughout the Old Testament, whenever, as we looked at Genesis and Exodus, every time we talked about one of the patriarchs, it was always your God, your God, Abraham, your God, Isaac, your God, Jacob. And then it reached a point for each one of them where they said, my God. There was an experience that they had where they felt like they had that direct relationship to God, but it wasn't until a certain point. There was a, uh, the, the, the process that they had to go through. And what does that verse say? No longer will, will they say that. but I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall say, teach, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me. You guys can identify with that, right? Me saying, well, I have the access to God, so let me tell you about him. Oh, darn, man, I wish I could know who God is. That's how it was before in the old covenant. The priesthood were the ones that had the direct access to God. And God says that with the new covenant, no longer. They're, everybody's going to know me. Everybody's going to know me. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none of them his brother saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. There's no status. You've heard this, the saying before, the ground is level at the cross. Everybody has that same access. And again, of course, all of this is being said in the context of accepting and receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's the new covenant. We're not talking about just random people having direct access to God for no reason. Everybody has the capability and the possibility, but it's only through Jesus Christ, the new covenant, that it can happen. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, sorry. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first one obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. <clears throat> I don't know how your guys' relationship with the Lord is doing right now, but I want to encourage you. If you're going through a difficult season and you think that it's the things that you can do to impress God, to make him feel better about you, it's going to work, no, it, it doesn't really work. You already have that access to God through Jesus Christ, and he wants you to use it. Now, I have, I have a, a family member who um, and I'm just using this as an example, okay? So I had a family member who, who used to smoke a lot, three, four, five packs a day. I'm talking a lot, like chain smoking. And there was a point where he asked to move in with me and I was a believer at the time, and, and obviously it was after I started walking with the Lord, and he, and, 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 and he needed a place to stay. He was my elder. He was family. I said, sure, come on in. And he was always out on our front patio smoking constantly. 
and I said to him, hey, man, you know, you shouldn't be smoking so much. And he's like, it's cool. No, I, I just like smoking. And I'm like, but you shouldn't be doing it. And I went actually to Hebrews chapter 10, and I started to reason with him. I'm like, listen, you can't continue sinning, because it wasn't just the smoking, it was his lifestyle. I said, you can't continue to live in sin once God has redeemed you. If you say that you believe in Jesus Christ, your life should be different and should be changing you're not the same person that you were before. That's what born again means. And he's like, yeah, but listen, smoking isn't that big of a deal because I believe in Jesus and smoking is just something that makes me feel better. But I made a deal with God and I stopped eating pork. So it's like a little exchange. I don't eat bacon anymore or any pork and God lets me smoke. And I said, I don't think that's in the Bible. This isn't like a negotiation. This isn't like a pick and choose which laws you want to obey. And if I don't like that one, then I could switch it out with another one. This is about God writing his law on your mind and in your heart. It's about desiring to be near him, to know who he is. Not having to go to church once a week or once a month or whatever, but wanting to go. Because you're with other brothers and sisters who want to know him and you want to know him together and you're going forward and you're knowing him corporately as a, as a family, as a community. And he doesn't just reveal stuff to you personally. He reveals stuff to you as a family. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of the coolest things I've learned about who God is was in a corporate worship environment. I'm not talking about worship as in the songs. I'm talking about being together, Bible study, living together, community. And if you want to grow in maturity spiritually, then you have to be in fellowship. If you don't care and you think that just believing in Jesus is enough and you don't have to go to church, you don't have to have fellowship, you won't grow as quickly spiritually. You just won't. <coughs> and a lot of times, <coughs> excuse me, I got a tickle right in my throat. And a lot of times the, the focus ends up being more on going back to being more on yourself. Being in fellowship, having access to God the Father. The main point being Jesus Christ seated in heaven. The law has been taken away. The new covenant's been given. It's, it's a better priesthood that he is part of. It's a better covenant. It's a better agreement with better promises. And that is something that we have to give to people. Even, even, you know, the Mormon that comes to my door, one of the first things I have to say to them, don't, don't you get tired of having to do all this stuff, of, of all these man-made rules? Don't you get weary? Because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you tired? You just started, man. You're just doing your first two years or whatever. You just started. It gets worse. You're older and you're locked into a system that tells you if you do certain things, then you're going to be blessed. And if you don't do certain things, then you're not going to be blessed. And I have to tell you, I'm blessed every day. Even when I make mistakes, God reveals his heart to me. He shows me what repentance means, what it looks like. He, he gives me forgiveness and I'm blessed. And then my heart cries out, Abba, Father, I want to know you more. I want to be closer to you than I ever have been before because I've never experienced this kind of love before. It's not the law. It's grace. It's the new covenant in the blood of his son. Let's pray. Lord, we pray we ask that we would never be in the place where we would start to put the emphasis more on works than receiving your free gift of grace. We don't want the emphasis to be on what we can do because you've done so much more. 
You can do so much more. You're so much greater than we are. And God, we want to make sure we're in the place where we're coming humbly before you, engaging you in the new covenant through your son, Jesus Christ, and telling others about it also. As we look out and see a world that's weary and trying to keep laws and rules, it's not that we don't live by laws or rules, but it's a desire that you've given us to be like you. You give us those words, Lord, to share with others, to share your gospel, to share your good news, to love others the way that you've loved us and that you do it in us today, that you do it in us as a church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.